You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Hello, everybody. My name is Vivian Guerin. I'm an adjunct assistant professor in the School of Social Work and Social Policy in Trinity College, Dublin. And my job and task today is is to chair this webinar. And I want to thank you all and welcome you to this uh, INCJ webinar event, which, as you're all aware, is on the development of international standards for the use of artificial intelligence in criminal justice. And we hope that the conversation will be both lively and interesting. I certainly expect that it will, because apart from anything else, there is hardly uh, a day that goes by without all of us hearing news and various media items on the significance of the reach and impact of artificial intelligence, or IA, AI, sorry, in all our lives. And uh, that's including in the various parts of the criminal justice system. And from the criminal justice system's point of view in relation to AI, um, the co-secretary to the Council of Europe's uh, committee on AI, Louise Riondel, recently was quoted as saying that regulation is the key to regaining trust in AI and ensuring the technology is used responsibly. And that's a part of the issue that is to the fore in all our minds today as we consider the regulation and the creation of standards uh, regarding AI and its use within the criminal justice system. So how is the webinar going to work from a practical point of view? We're going to have a short introduction by Pia Pualaka, and that will be followed by a contribution from each of our two respondents, Matt Rowland and Stephen van der Steen. And then we're going to have a roundtable discussion with responses to your comments and your questions. The webinar, as Rob said, is being recorded. So if you could keep your microphones off while the main speakers are speaking, and please do use your own uh, names in your uh, title on your Zoom screen. And we want the audience, we want you to put points and ask questions to the round table so there are a number of ways of doing that. In the first instance, you can use the chat function, which is um, you know, a very appropriate way to do it, a very easy way to do it. And we'll keep track of those questions and comments as we, as we go along. Later on, uh, you'll also have an opportunity to use the raise hands function uh, and uh, to literally raise your hands if uh, on the screen so I, I can see it and bring people uh, into the discussion. I would ask that people would try to keep their questions brief and to the point. And if anyone is making comments, please do keep those even more brief or briefer. Um, moving on then, um, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to briefly introduce themselves. Um, if they could say their name, their role, and why they are interested in this topic. Um, so I'll start then with our main speaker today, Pia Boalaka, who is a senior specialist team leader and forensic psychologist in the Prison and Probation Service of Finland. So maybe Pia, you would introduce yourself briefly. Yes, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to, to speak here. And good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Pia Boalaka, and I've been working for the Finnish Prison and Probation Service since 2012. And I used to work as a project manager for the Smart Prison project, implementing uh, first uh, cell devices with digital services to Finnish prisons. And currently I work as a team leader in the operative management unit, and I'm still responsible for various rehabilitative and digital services uh, in prisons and probations. And I'm also leading a RISE AI project, developing artificial intelligence applications for offender management. And I'm a co-chair of the Europrise ICT expert group. And I was also part of the Council of Europe's Council for Penological Cooperations expert group, uh, developing recommendations for the use of AI in corrections. 
And I believe that's why I'm here today. And as Vivian said, I'm a forensic psychologist and psychotherapist by education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pia. And you've absolutely hit the nail on the head in one of your last points there that the uh, main thrust of your presentation today and what we'll be discussing is that project in which you were, which you have played a key role in the development of the Council of Europe standards regarding artificial intelligence in the prison and probation systems. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to now uh, invite our, our first respondent to Pia's presentation, Matt Rowland, who's a former Chief Administrative Officer of the United States Court Service and now providing oversight and support to federal probation and pretrial services in the U.S. to introduce yourself, Matt. Uh, greetings from Washington, D.C. in uh, sunny USA today. Um, yeah, as, as Vivian mentioned, I had a 30-year career with the federal judiciary. Uh, that finished up with me being the senior executive for the probation pretrial system, where we have been piloting with AI uh, for a little bit now. Uh, since retiring from the government, I have been working with uh, in a consulting capacity, primarily on IT projects, including AI projects for corrections and court organizations, uh, not just at the federal level, but the state and international level as well. Okay. Thank you, Matt. And finally, I want to ask our second respondent uh, today, um, Stephen Van der Steen, who is a specialist consultant in IT systems and solutions with Smart Corrections in France. Stephen, will you introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this webinar. Uh, so yes, uh, my name is Stephen Van der Steen. I live in France, but originally I'm from Belgium. Uh, I started my career in the Belgian Ministry of Justice and I've uh, been there for several roles, uh, but the main uh, capacity as a CIO of the Belgian Prison Service. Uh, I have been very active in different international projects at that time and in 2015 I um, started to work part-time as a researcher at the Montfort University doing research mainly on the concept of digital rehabilitation and also we did some, some work together with Dr. Victoria Knight on ethical aspects of using technology in corrections. And also, I'm very active as a consultant, uh, mainly for different jurisdictions across Europe, and also work for international organizations to support and digital transformation journeys for jurisdictions all across the globe. And I'm also a board member of the International Correction and Prisons Association, where I'm the board liaison for the Technology Solutions Network. Um, so, and uh, within that network and within the activities we do, uh, of course, AI is, is a very important topic uh, and uh, I'm happy to share some of my insights and, and knowledge about this today. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. And we look forward to that as well. So thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, Pia, for introducing yourselves. And we'll move on to the presentation, the main presentation. You know, I should have pointed out as well that Pia now is going to speak for about 15 minutes with her presentation. Um, and then both Matt and Stephen will each have between five and 10 minutes to respond before we open up the round table to questions and comments from the floor, uh, so to speak. So just before Pia starts, um, I, I, th I think it's fair to say that the Council of Europe, um, you know, among many players and stakeholders has been on as extremely uh, concerned and energized about the whole topic of artificial intelligence. And as part of the Council of Europe's response in, in that field, set about, uh, among other things, the development of standards for the use of AI in the criminal justice system, and particularly for the purpose of today's conversation within prison and probation systems. So I want to invite Pia now to share with us her presentation regarding her key role in the uh, development and recent completion of those standards for the use of AI in prisons and probation. Pia, over to you. Yes, thank you. And let's see how sharing screen succeeds. And I believe you now see my slides. Yes, perfectly, thank you. Yes, so let's begin, and I try to keep it 15 minutes, as you said. So, first of all, um, I want to point out that on the 17th of May, so just a couple of weeks ago, Council of Europe uh, adopts the first international treaty on artificial intelligence. 
And these are the general recommendations for the use of AI. And it was the intention that only after this release, we are going to re release the recommendations for the use of AI and related digital technologies for prison and probation service. So just to note that uh, the general treaty is already released. And it's the first ever international legally binding treaty for the use of AI systems. And it takes a rather risk-based approach to the design, development and use of AI systems, which requires carefully considering any potential negative consequences of using AI systems. And the outcome was uh, uh, done by the Committee on Artificial Intelligence. It brought together uh, all the 46 Council of Europe member states, 11 European, uh, the European Union and 11 non-member states as well as representatives of the private sector, civil society and academia who participated as observers. And this treaty will be opened for signature on 5th of September. And the idea is that the recommendations for prison and probation services are then uh, launched after this. And of course, uh, these recommendations are aligned with the general convention. And then to the recommendations for prison and probation service, we had an expert group working uh, 2022 to 2023. And the official name of the paper will be Ethical and Organizational Aspects of the Use of Artificial Intelligence and Related Digital Technologies by Prison and Probation Services. And I was honored to work with the best colleagues ever, Håkan Klarin from Swedish Prison and Probation Service and Fernando Miro Linares, Professor of Criminology and Criminal Law. And together we worked as an expert group for the Council of uh, Europe's Council for Penological Cooperation. And regarding the recommendations that is intended for the Council of Europe member states, member states um, it recommends that governments of member states be guided in their legislation, criminal policy and practice by these principles and rules and ensure that this recommendation and its explanatory explanatory report are translated and disseminated as widely as possible, including judicial authorities, prosecution, police, prison and probation service, juvenile justice services as well as among private companies, which often design and provide these AI systems, in, also in the framework of the criminal justice system. And the public authorities in charge of prison and probation services remain fully responsible for ensuring respect for these principles. And they should also ensure that the private companies, which design uh, these technologies, follow the same principles as stated in the recommendations. We decided to uh, use these two terms, artificial intelligence and related digital technologies, defining AI uh, machine-based systems that for explicit or implicit objectives infers from the input it receives how to generate outputs such as predictions, content, recommendations, or decisions that may influence physical or virtual environments. And of course, different AI systems vary in their levels of autonomy and adaptiveness. And related digital technologies is rather a, a generic term that refers to all electronic devices, automatic systems, and technological resources that generate, process, or store information and data, which are being used by AI. Uh, here I've just listed some examples that are also stated in the recommendations that how AI and, and related technologies can be used in corrections. So there are many possibilities, many applications, many benefits, but also, of course, risk factors related to these. 
natural language processing, voice and speech recognition, image recognition, especially facial recognition, data analysis for large sets of data, predictive models uh, for behaviour prediction, prediction, optimization, recommender and expert systems, which are already used in some offender management systems, and then for rehabilitation and learning, uh, for example, virtual reality and augmented reality systems are already used uh, in the field of corrections and probably many more in the future. But then do the principles, uh, the three key principles uh, here uh, for these technologies to be used legit legitimately and proportionately, uh, they have to contribute to the rehabilitation and reintegration of offenders. They must not replace prison and probation staff, but rather assist them in their everyday work, help the criminal justice system, the execution of penal sanctions, measures, and the reduction of recidivism. And the paper itself is divided into six chapters. So altogether, there are 30 principles in this paper. And I'm not going to state them all, but uh, just go through some of the most important ones. There are some basic principles, then principles regarding data protection and privacy, uh, use of AI for safety, security, and good order, use for offender management, risk assessment, rehabilitation and reintegration, use for staff selection, management, training and development, and then last but not least, research, development, evaluation and revision. So first to the basic principles. First of all, when using AI systems, there must be respect for human rights and dignity of all persons impacted by use of AI. And we must aim for least negative impact on human rights. And uh, we should uh, work in conformity with the international standards and defined by national law and liability for any unlawful harm caused by AI should be ensured. Biases are one risk factor that should be prevented to ensure equality and to prevent or resolve the creation or identification of any discrimination or inequality between individuals or groups of individuals. Transparent to public scrutiny, monitored on a regular basis, and the logic behind and the outcomes of using AI should be sufficiently explainable. Then, when a decision is based on the use of AI and affects human rights, human supervision and effective complaint procedures should be put in place. Data should be accurate and sufficiently representative, the general population and minority groups. Preserve and promote positive and beneficial human relations between staff and offenders. And all AI users should understand the basics regarding what this use implies. So there should be a level of enough AI literacy. For data protection and privacy, we must remember offenders continue to enjoy their fundamental rights and freedoms when AI systems are used, including also the right to respect for private life and the right to data protection. All key actors, whether they be private sector, or public sector, that participate in designing and using the AI systems should comply with data protection law, be transparent, and also able to demonstrate how they comply with data protection principles and obligations. Uh, data should be stored in a form that allows a personal identification for no longer than is necessary. And only the amount and type of personal data which are strictly necessary to fulfill a specific task should be collected, stored or otherwise processed by AI systems. 
use for the safety, security, and good order. Uh, use of AI for maintaining safety, security, and good order should also allow for better risk and crisis management in prisons and probations. And prison and probation services should be consulted in order to identify the specific needs uh, regarding the assistance of staff through AI. And the use of electronic monitoring, including biometric recognition technologies, should be proportionate to the purpose and only used when strictly necessary. Always carried out under regular human control and be human-centered also. For offender management, AI can be used to manage offenders' files and particular cases, and for example, to generate automatic alerts in cases of non-compliance. Just that we must remember that the final responsibility for decisions remains with the professionals, with the humans. When used for increasing the accuracy and objectivity of risk assessment, well, the challenges of algorithmic biases and quality and representativeness of data should be addressed. And when collecting information regarding, for example, risk factors, uh, this kind of data should only be used for risk management, not for other purposes. And we must remember that in many ways we can, of course, um, uh, facilitate um, and help the re rehabilitation and reintegration of offenders, as well as their social contacts and medical treatment via AI systems. But we shouldn't forget about the importance of face-to-face -face contact or, or replace face-to-face -face contact with these. For uh, staff selection management, uh, we can use AI systems to optimize uh, certain capacities and processes, but even more important, uh, we could focus on supporting the staff's professional development. Uh, also, AI can be used to assist uh, to predict future organizational uh, uh, capacity uh, uh, resourcing, especially the problematic areas. And again, the person now should have the right to be informed of the reasons for decisions based on AI and should also have the right to request uh, the human review. So the responsibility remains for professionals, not for the AI system itself. The design and development as well as research uh, should be sufficiently well-funded and supported and help develop further the proper and efficient use of AI. And AI systems should be evaluated at regular interval, intervals by independent, competent evaluators. And procedures and resources should be in place to regularly monitor, identify, assess, prevent and mitigate possible risks and adverse effects. And the last principle actually states that also this recommendation needs to be reviewed regularly and revised accordingly in order to continue working to protect human rights and fundamental freedoms of its users and the safety and security of our societies. AI is developing fast, so it's uh, important that we review also the recommendations regularly. Then I listed here some Finnish examples. Uh, we are, of course, here also waiting for the recommendations to be released so we can check that our projects also align with the principles stated. But we are developing something for the offender management specifically. And we've also had uh, a national AI program by Ministry of Finance that we are also uh, using with our offenders. We are also participating in the so-called training AI work as prison labor in three prisons. Sounds exotic, but it's actually a very simple task. And we also provide some online courses for our offenders to increase AI literacy. Of course, also other skills and providing um, 
something meaningful and educational for, for offenders. The latest one is a, a project regarding uh, a chatbot for customer service on our, on our public website. Should we worry about AI in prisons and probations? Well, now that we have very precise recommendations, I think it helps the member state governments to decide um, how to use AI in an ethical way. AI has certain benefits, but also risk factors. And I think when using AI, we must remember that uh, it assists human decision-making and the intention of using AI must be ethical. So we are, of course, uh, trying to contribute to the rehabilitation and reintegration of offenders. That should be our main priority when, when using AI systems. And in the future, AI literacy is a necessity for all correction staff and offenders. Some references here, and I think I've used my 15 or maybe even 17 minutes, but thank you. Thank you very much, Pia. In fact, when you were under 17 minutes, you were pretty close to bang on target. So thank you very much for that. And particularly, thank you for the clarity that you brought to your presentation on a very technical and very intricate subject, which was really, really impressive in, in your presentation. I sometimes feel we can all get a bit hypnotized by uh, technology and particularly something like AI and really the clarity of your focus in terms of principles uh, and everything else that you included in your presentation was really impressive in this fast moving field. So continuing with the theme of fast moving, I'm going to call on our first responder uh, to Pia's in introductory presentation and Matt Rowland is our next contributor and I want to invite Matt to give us a uh, a perspective from his own situation, maybe from the United States perspective on AI standards and math, uh, you're invited now to speak for five to 10 minutes uh, responding to Pia. So over to you, Matt. Great. Thank you. And a great job, Pia. Um, I, I think the bad news is here in the US, we're not as far along in our thinking on regulation and guidance on the use of AI. I think the good news is if I were a betting man, I suspect that we're going to wind up in a place very similar to what Pia described, where it's a risk-based system, it's principle-based, and I think it will be flexible enough to deal as the technology emerges over time. But yet again, those guiding principles could keep everybody uh, focused on the ethical use and mitigate the negative aspects of AI and exploit its positive ones. Um, again, here in the US, the regulation of AI has been very much a patchwork. And the reason for that is that the federal government is responsible for regulating interstate and international commerce and all things at the national level. Uh, and it's still right now very much in a fact gathering and study mode in relation to AI. In the interim, what they're doing is they've adopted a strategy to leverage traditional laws and existing regulations uh, to address any current harms that are caused by ER, uh, I'm sorry, AI. Um, for example, they, they are using uh, traditional laws related to fraud and deceptive practices, uh, privacy and civil rights and intellectual property protections, all in an AI context without new legislation necessarily, uh, but again, using the framework that pre-existed. And in the federal government, there are, there are three branches of the government I want to touch briefly on where they are in relation to AI. Uh, the legislature, which is Congress, as several committees currently looking into AI issues with an eye towards a sort of global overarching legislation that will provide some uniformity throughout the country. Uh, you may have seen there was some relatively high profile congressional hearings uh, with leaders from social media platforms uh, specifically focused on those platforms being used by AI related applications for disinformation campaigns, particularly related to elections, uh, but other issues as well. So that caught a lot of attention here in the U.S. Uh, in the executive branch, uh, President Biden issued an executive order in October uh, 2022. Uh, that essentially put the agencies and the federal government on notice to prepare for AI issues, both in terms of using AI at the agency level to become more effective and efficient, but also how AI may need uh, or generate needs for changes in policy statements. 
uh, legislation and regulation to still achieve agency's mission. Uh, for example, uh, right now, based on that executive order, uh, the Security Exchange Commission is looking into how AI may impact Wall Street and how they regulate stocks and bonds. Uh, the impact on the job market, particularly in associated with robotics uh, and the advances being made there, that's being studied by the Department of Labor. Uh, transportation, the self-driving vehicles, again, that would be the purview of the Department of Transportation who study extensively. And where we're concerned uh, in terms of criminal justice use of AI, that's fallen to the Department of Justice. And they've been very active in forming work groups um, and interacting with uh, industry leaders as well as their stakeholders about the appropriate role of AI and concerns people may have. Uh, relatedly, they uh, issued several white papers to familiarize people like myself uh, who are in the criminal justice realm with AI generally and its potential as well as its risks. Uh, they've also funded pilots. For example, they have uh, funded uh, video analysis for our surveillance videos uh, to help uh, prevent and detect crime. Uh, also, DNA analysis being facilitated by AI has been funded as well. And the Department of Justice has developed a strategic plan on its own use of artificial intelligence, and that will be a, a guiding document for the additional things that come along. Um, the judiciary, the third part of the federal government, uh, where I worked for a very long time, is already involved in the sense that it's resolving lawsuits related to AI. Uh, they're dealing with such issues as can AI be granted a patent for something it creates? Uh, can AI replicate or mimic individuals without that individual's consent? Uh, and in the criminal justice realm, the one that's probably been um, litigated the most is what are defendants' due process rights? in relation to AI algorithms that may influence whether they're released on bail pending trial or what sentence they receive or how their sentence is enforced. Uh, also part of the judiciary is the federal probation and pretrial services system that, I, again, I was part of. Um, we have been piloting its use in several regards. Um, Vivian, we published an article in the Irish Probation Journal um, on using AI to digest uh, incredible amounts, terabytes of data from documents to help identify patterns among mental health conditions uh, exhibited by people pending sentence. And we were using that to try to anticipate what treatment interventions we would need moving forward uh, and other things that would help mitigate uh, those conditions. Uh, we also have an upcoming article in the Federal Probation Journal here in the US evaluating the use of AI to go through recorded videos of officers' interactions with either people under supervision or in mock um, interviews following training on evidence-based practices to assess their retention of the material, their use of the material, um, because very often right now, a lot of our studies, um, we're not sure of the fidelity in relation to actually applying the practices. The other two things I just want to touch on real briefly is in addition to federal government regulation, there's state and local governments that can regulate the use of AI in their jurisdictions as well. Um, so far, that is primarily focused on specific use cases and transparency. So I'll give an example. The state of California has issued regulations and continues to look into um, how it can combat deep fakes, uh, the biometric information uh, without people's permission. So that's been done at the state level in California. My native New York City, for example, is has laws related to AI, AI transparency, where people have to be notified when they're interacting with an AI application, um, or if their information related to them personally is being used in relation to AI. And lastly, I wanted to touch on real quickly, um, the private sector here in the US is developing best practices and a number of other things that the government is surely likely to leverage as well moving forward. So one firm that I'm familiar with is Accenture, uh, which is very active here in the U.S., but I believe is actually based out of the European Union. Um, they have, in addition to their normal legal review and ethical review of their projects, they have a special board that focuses on AI issues and tries to flag potential risks related to AI development in its projects and how to mitigate that risk. And these are separate and apart from people who are the project leaders who 
are developing the application itself or trying to solicit business to do so. Um, and the idea there is that decision makers can be given independent information to make better decisions based on that. But I think on the whole, if I, again, had to suspect it or had to bet, I think we're going to wind up in a very similar place in the U.S. in the not, me not too far future to what Pia described in terms of that risk and principle-based approach to regulating AI here in the U.S. Thank you very much, Matt. That's been a really interesting tour of the uh, perspective and situation and approach to AI it, it, across a wide spectrum of areas of, of operations, but particularly in, in relation to the criminal justice system. Uh, so thank you very much for that. And I'll move straight on then to uh, Stephen van der Steen and ask Stephen to give his perspective um, for, as an independent technology expert and advisor on digital strategies for corrections uh, in the various places that you operate and work in, Stephen. So over to you. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, thank you, Pia, for the, for the introduction. And also thank you, Matt, for, for sharing what's happening in the United States. Uh, and I heard some, some interesting use cases that I, I will remember. Uh, so a lot is going on. Uh, but let me first come back to, to the recommendations that Pia has explained. Uh, um, first of all, I would say, I think it's, it's, it's true. It's really valuable. It's important to have regulations and, and, and recommendations on the use of AI. Um, I, I, I strongly believe and agree with, with, with the, the statement that you put in the beginning, Vivian, about we need regulations and we need frameworks uh, uh, to gain trust in, in this, this very new technology. However, i kind of a little bit disappointed that we needed AI before starting making regulations. Uh, what I mean with that is that we are already using like 20, 30, 40, even more years technology without having real regulations. Uh, so. Probably it's about the the the, the fear about AI that, that that it's kind of emotionally loaded because we call it intelligence and that that's typically something that that we attribute to human beings that 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 we all uh, getting afraid and we are starting to regulate things. Uh, so it's a good thing. Again, I think it's important to do that, but we have uh, skipped a couple of decades of regulations uh, which, which we should have. Because um, the, the, the risk of, of looking at AI regulations is that we think, okay, what we are doing, for example, implementing technology in corrections is nothing related to AI, so those rules don't apply to what I'm doing. Uh, uh, so there are a lot of principles like uh, proportionality, uh, uh, legality, that, that are already relevant for the use of technology for decades. So um, again, I think it's very important to have regulations, but I think and uh, we need to take in account that everything we do, everywhere where we implement technology, those basic principles are, are necessary to support us with the design and how we implement technology. So that's the first remark I would, I would uh, uh, put here. And this is also strong related uh, to my second point. Um, uh, Pia and myself, we done some research, uh, and yeah, it has been like four years ago, about the state uh, of play on, 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 on reflecting and using technology in corrections. And although there has been some changes uh, based on, on, on what I hear and what I, what I have seen uh, during the last uh, technology corrections conference in Istanbul a couple of weeks ago, but still the majority of the jurisdictions I work or I talk to are far away from, from thinking about AI. Uh, and I think it's um, not only uh, regulations is not only potentially creating more trust, but is also creating fear. Um, so I think there is additional work that we need to do is, is look at each individual use case and support not only what we should not do, but support and guide jurisdictions and people uh, about best practices, how to do it correctly uh, based on the principles that, that, that we uh, focus on. So that's a second very important thing uh, and, and, and the necessity for, for, yeah, for really helping jurisdictions how to do it properly, how to make sure that when we use artificial intelligence, uh, it's, it's implemented uh, for the good and we avoid negative side effects. Related to that second point, uh, we also have to think, and that's, that's my, my, my head as, as a consultant uh, uh, on, on digital strategies, 
We also have to think also what is in fact the problem we need to we want to solve before thinking how we can use technology. Sometimes the things are the the, the order between the two has, has has changed. So people think, oh, new technology, there we should use it. I think that's that's a wrong reasoning. We have to fi- look at the problems we have, and then maybe technology can help us with that. So in this context, I think there are there are a couple of of uh, problems that 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 there are globally. Uh, um, the, the difficulty we have on, on rehabilitation, come back on that, and then and the, the high reoffending rates that we have. Of course, overcrowding in, in prisons. But uh, another one I think that it's, it's, it's rather recent uh, is the problem we have in, in, in with uh, uh, the retention of staff and the recruitment of staff. Um, I hear uh, a lot of uh, fear about uh, AI and other technologies that they will take away jobs. Uh, and that's the reason not to use it. Uh, but we are in this very specific situation where all over the world, we are really struggling in keeping staff and recruiting staff in our prisons. So I think it would be very interesting to take that at the starting point and, and look at and AI and other technologies could, could help us uh, with that, not by replacing the officer as a human being, but focusing on replacing tasks that could be done by machines and focusing also on discovering what is the human element and the importance of, of human uh, um, uh, interventions in prisons. Uh, uh, so I think that there's, there's a huge opportunity there to take this piece of, of new technology and also the crisis to bring them together and to, to reflect, uh, taking account, of course, all the principles we just talked about and trying to find a way to still keep the human at, uh, at the lead of all, all what they do. So those were some of the reflections. Uh, there are a lot of use cases uh, that already have mentioned by, 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 by Matt, for example. I think uh, that for each of that use case, uh, it's, it's a different uh, situation. It's a different context. It's a, it needs to be t- uh, dif- uh, uh, differently. So it's important uh, uh, that uh, besides, as I already mentioned, besides the generic regulations and recommendations, that, that there is really more uh, deep uh, research and also uh, uh, guidance on on those different use cases, uh, how to, how to how to use technology uh, and how how to use uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, in in the prison setting. And thank you, Matt, uh, and some very important points raised there. Um, some of the kind of chicken and egg questions, I guess, in terms of what needs to come first, vis a vis principles and how we operate our systems. So. Absolutely, really, really important points to add to what Pia and Matt have said. So we we have about an hour, or not an hour, half an hour left, um, roughly. Uh, we don't have to go on that long, but we have up to a half an hour for the remaining time in the webinar, and we have some questions in already. Um, one question that was asked earlier, which is um, a kind of a general one, is will the slides that Pia showed in her presentation be made available? So just to remind people that the webinar is being recorded and will be will be made available on the INCJ website and it would be anticipated that subject to Pia's approval that uh, her slides would be made available on the website as well as part of the presentation. I see Pia is nodding her head there. So I'm I'm facing yes, that. Definitely. In. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Pia. We have a, a, a very specific question then directed towards Pia in the chat um, from Adil Ali, who's in Fordham University. And uh, they ask, I think AI brings opportunities, but at the same time, it could become a liability if it is not monitored. And did you come across any such challenge while teaching AI education to inmates or while using AI to manage prisons or while designing offender rehabilitation programs. And I'm guessing, Pia, that this question uh, veers as much, if not more, into your day-to-day experience within the Mm -hmm. Finnish prison and probation system and the evolution and development and implementation there of the smart prisons, for example, and some of the projects that you described. So would you, would you like, to respond to that question from Adil. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, I think regarding AI, we are still in the very beginning. 
So for example, the RISE AI uh, feature for the offender management system is still in the design phase, but it has taken quite a lot of time with experts to actually define a recommender system that mimics the kind of process that uh, human experts are doing when they analyze offenders' risks and needs and and try to decide what kind of services would be good for them and to what prison unit, particular unit, the particular offender should be placed. So we are still in the beginning. We are in the experimenting phase. Uh, and this is the reality with many jurisdictions, as, as Stephen explained. But... Uh, we are interested to see even the preliminary results when we finally finally get them. In general, I think prisoners have taken all this digitalization uh, process in Finland very well. So they are very pleased. And I, uh, I think also this uh, studying AI and training AI as prison work has been interesting. Something different to prisoners compared to the so-called uh, traditional prison life and prison work and what can be done in prison or what cannot done be done in prison. Of course, we collect um, a lot of feedback uh, uh, from prisoners and also staff. And uh, for the moment, uh, we've collected most of the feedback regarding the so-called smart prison uh, system we, we provided. So that is not yet... Uh, AI, well, maybe a little bit somewhere there, but more like providing digital services for prisoners directly from the cell. So this, of course, uh, gives prisoners more opportunities to use services also from outside prison and contact their relatives and contact um, their lawyers and uh, um, study online, etc. So these are very important basic rights for prisoners that we can provide via using digital technologies, which is which is very important. Then we have some, I forgot to mention, we use also virtual reality in some prisons for rehabilitation. And we are also working in collaboration with the prisoner healthcare uh, unit in providing uh, therapy that combines this virtual reality besides traditional therapy. So so far, uh, it's been positive, but of course, uh, we must be careful when, when going further. And that's why we need the recommendations to the, the, the ones by Council of Europe. Okay, thank you for that response, Pia. Maybe I can lead from that final point that you made regarding the recommendation of, or the recommendation of the Council of Europe and the standards that that will set for the use of AI in prisons and probation. And I have a question then, you know, whether it's in relation to the Council of Europe or other bodies that, that set standards in this area, how real are the standards and specifically, uh, how can AI standards or standards in relation to the use of AI be enforced? And I'm conscious of a point made by Matt, for example, that areas of the private sector in the United States are, are you know, taking very proactive steps to develop best practice in the use of AI and equally by a point that Stephen made regarding, uh, you know, that different jurisdictions, whether in Europe or across the world, are at different stages of development. In some, there may be an element of fear about, you know, what's being imposed or what's expected. And I'm just wondering, going back to that question, when, you, when you're dealing with all of that, the standards being set by government bodies within the private sector and then different jurisdictions that might be impacted uh, being at different stages of development, how real can the standards be? How can they be enforced? And I might start, Pia, with Matt on, and Stephen on that before I come back to you because I've, I've been putting you under a bit of pressure over the last few minutes. So, Matt, do you want to respond to that first of all and then Stephen and then we'll come back to Pia? Uh, sure. And I think, um, again, if you view AI as a tool, it, it's not something in and of itself. It's it's not on like a, a motor vehicle where probation officers use or other things that they may use. That it's usually the intent and the impact that it has that it still makes it, it still allows it to fall in line with traditional approaches to liability, whether that be lawsuits and civil liability or criminal prosecution and criminal responsibility. So I, I do think there's an issue of magnitude 
that comes into when you're talking about AI. But I think traditional uh, principles of accountability and um, addressing harms still very much kick in. And these regulations, uh, depending on the agency who issues them here in the U.S., for example, if it's a congressional statute, there's usually civil liability, criminal liability that goes with violating that. Same thing with uh, with agencies. Uh, Security Exchange Commission, for example, can prevent a company from issuing bonds and, and can actually fine them if they violate their AI regulations. So I think, uh, for me anyway, I keep going back to, while it's a, an incredibly powerful tool and it's a new tool and an evolving tool, that the mechanisms we use to regulate it shouldn't be too different than what we've done historically. Okay, thanks, Matt. Stephen? Yes, um, I, I, I agree with Matt. Uh, however, I, I think what's unique with AI is that the, the, the responsibility pushes much more, uh, is much more pushed towards uh, uh, the business people, if I can say it like that. Whether, for example, previous regulations like the GDPR were more something like for the, for the, 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 the security people, the IT people, the security uh, officer. Now, because of the, the vast impact that AI could have and the risk it has on, on, on all responsibilities, I think uh, uh, it's, it's more responsibility of, of business people and leaders. And, and I think that also uh, uh, explains a little bit the attention that goes to recommendations at, at uh, uh, all levels of society and, 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 and government. So I think the enforcement of, of, of those, those regulations uh, will be uh, done uh, thanks to that. Uh, it will be easier uh, thanks to that. Uh, of course, you have the legal consequences. Uh, but still, I think it's also the responsibility of all the jurisdictions to 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 take this in account and and to manage those principles uh, uh, in, 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 uh, at the level of of their their IT governance uh, of their uh, strategical level and not uh, push this back down to the IT departments and let them figure it out. So that I think it's 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 uh, often happen and it often happens in the past and I think it it should be now hopefully uh, a momentum uh, for taking uh, responsibility at all uh, uh, parts, uh, levels of, of the organization. Thank you, Stephen. Pia, would you like to come in on that about the uh, enforcement of the standards? In this case, we're talking about the Council of Europe standards, but the same principle could apply in the United States or in other parts of the world that might develop similar standards. Yes, that's a, that's a very challenging question, how to actually implement and enforce these recommendations, because uh, the field of AI is still very, um, how would I say, only e uh, experts in the field can deeply understand uh, all the aspects of it. And uh, it's been a lot of work, at least here in Finland, to explain, uh, even with, um, with the first stage of digitalization, that why we should do it and what are the benefits and how we can actually already tackle the risks technically and also regarding how staff learns to um, include uh, digitalization and AI into their work. And I think there's also a lot of um, uh, controversies in our field that, on the other hand, we are struggling with serious problems, like Stephen mentioned, overcrowding and staff turnover. So we are in the situation that we would need uh, and we would definitely benefit from taking more digital tools in, into, into our practices. But on the other hand, the staff and also sometimes the administrative level is uh, concentrated on the, on the risks and fears surrounding digitalization and AI, which is understandable because corrections and prison and probation service are a high risk environment and field in many ways. So um, there's going to be a lot of work to do in the future. I, but I think also the pressure of the society uh, will affect in the long run. So it's always the situation that the society proceeds faster with new innovations and AI and prisons are always a little bit lacking behind in the development, which is understandable because we are high risk and very special field. But what I'm seeing is that things proceed very fast in the normal society and, and we, should, we should keep up with the pace. We should be able to modernize uh, in the same way as the rest of the society if we want to fulfill 
our target, which is to reintegrate and rehabilitate offenders. Otherwise, we are not able to do it if we lack behind the development all the time. So this is this is what I try to explain here in Finland when, when I'm starting new projects that uh, we, we definitely need these kind of projects. Okay. Did Vivian freeze? Um, oh. I'm just going to follow up then on your hand, bring in. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought I was... Um, I was lost for a minute. Uh, if, if I can follow up on that last point that you made, one of the, the the ones towards the end of your of your last comment about the rehabilitation and reintegration of offenders, we have a couple of questions in. Uh, one from Vyacheslav Nestorenko, um, and another one from Sherry Townsend. Um, Vyacheslav's is what type of implementation of AI is more appropriate, and what should be done first? finding a field, creation of a program, and then correct legislation according to this program, or is it some other uh, approach should be taken? And Sherry says, if the problem we are trying to solve is how do we create better outcomes from treatment and rehabilitation programs? Do we have research where specific digital strategies have accomplished this? And I would just add in uh, particularly AI. So if we can focus uh, you know, among our panelists on the issue of of that point you made, uh, Pia, about rehabilitation and reintegration. What's the best approach? Well, first of all, can AI be used appropriately there? And if so, what's what's the best approach, do you think, regarding the use of AI in rehabilitation and reintegration work? And then I'll go on to Matt and Stephen. Okay. Yeah, so I think uh, in Finland maybe it was just accidentally, but uh, we started with providing the online courses on AI for both offenders, and we also recommended the same program to all our staff. And that was an online uh, course on the basics of AI uh, made by Helsinki University. So we started to collaborate in this way to make the AI more uh and understandable to increase the AI literacy, and I think it was a good starting point. So I would say that start with small things that are easy to approach, that uh, everyone can uh, can join somehow. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, as Stephen also explained, the legislation has come uh, a little bit, or not, not actually even a little bit, but it's years behind. But that is... That is how it sometimes happens with, with other legislations too, that we understand the need for regulation only after already doing some experiments, or already after we have gathered some experiences, also the negative experiences. And so, um, and I think also the training, the training AI as prison labor was a good idea because the prisoners also got the experience and also the staff that, hey, this is something... Uh, that is e actually easy to do. It is not something exotic. Uh, this is the type of uh, work among others. And it's something new. It's something interesting. It doesn't require a lot of resources. It doesn't take a lot of time to uh, uh, adopt it. Uh, so this kind of small scale, um, easy, to, easy to use projects are the ones I think we should start with. Okay. Thank you very much, Pia. Matt, do you have any comments in relation to the specific use of AI uh, in rehabilitation and reintegration? I think we all we always think of some of the other more, or we're more inclined to think of the more basic tasks that AI can undertake, whether it's in a criminal justice system or, or otherwise. But is there an added value, particularly in relation to rehabilitation and reintegration, that AI can bring to the table? Very much so. And I agree with Pia that I think baby steps and incremental development is probably the smart approach. But in terms of the need, uh, and I, I can speak to here in the U.S., uh, most crimes in the U.S. go unsolved. And the people who are eventually prosecuted, convicted, and sentenced to imprisonment, most of those people will be rearrested within three years of their release. So our outcomes, we, we have a dramatic need for change. And the AI can offer that. 
but I agree with Stephen and his point that there's a lot of people staying on the sidelines for various reasons. And, and Pia mentioned them that, you know, sometimes it's funding, sometimes it's just the culture. Uh, but I also think people are waiting to see the dust clear and see where this is all going to go. And I think there's a huge cost to that. One, in terms that it will perpetuate the less than optimal outcomes that we have. But in response to the question, are there best practices? My experience is there aren't. Um, and the reason for that is that we're not experimenting enough with it and that there should be more agencies and more professionals in the criminal justice realm practicing in those small steps, those incremental steps. And the advantage of that is it will not only hopefully improve outcomes, but it will develop the best practices and will also allow criminal justice people, rather than reacting to regulation and legislation, it will help them inform what legislation and what regulations we need to improve the outcomes. So I would really encourage everyone out there to the degree that they, obviously it's a positive sign they're participating in this call to get more familiar with AI. But I think the question is, are there existing best practices? My answer is other than globally best practices for IT adoption, specifically to AI, there haven't been any that I found useful, but I think we need to develop them and we need to help shape the legislation and the regulation as it, as it progresses over time. Okay, thank you, Matt. Stephen, do you want to add anything to the debate about rehabilitation, reintegration? Um, uh, yes, I, I, I agree with Matt uh, uh, entirely that, that we need to do more experimenting because if I respond to the, the, the question from, from, from uh, uh, Cherry Towson, uh, there is unfortunately not much evidence, I think, on really use a directly use of AI in, in the context of the, of rehabilitation, I don't, I am not aware of any uh, 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 evidence yet uh, on on broadly using technology. There is some, uh, uh, and then I'm talking by direct uh, evidence, but indirectly uh, we have to realize that technology often is used, also AI, to do the same things but do them better. What I mean with that, if you if we know, and there's a lot of evidence uh, that education. It's very important, um, and if we see in different sectors that use of, of uh, technologies, uh, including AI, can improve the delivery of, of uh, education, I think it's it's already very interesting to assume that it also could improve uh, uh, the outcomes uh, and corrections. Uh, we know that uh, uh, in, in a lot of uh, countries, we have a lot of foreign nationals who don't speak the language, so if we can use uh, uh, AI uh, to, to help us translate uh, uh, um, the conversations, real-time conversations, to help us translate the information that they bring with, that, with them, I think it's logically that it will uh, uh, it will create better outcomes or at least make us work more efficient. So uh, there is a lot of uh, use cases that just can be already based on, on I think, very realistic ass assumptions, although there is no evidence yet that that, that out outcome will be there. Okay, thank you, Stephen. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. We have we have a limited amount of time left. We have three questions. So what I'm going to propose to do, maybe abusing my position as chair, I'll, I'll summarize three questions. I'll invite the panel to opt for whichever answer to each question, if you like, because I want to give at the end each of our um, speakers, presenters, an opportunity to do uh, say yes, those words before we wrap up. So, if people are happy with that, um, uh, questions and they're about the issue of unintended consequences, as Jerry put it, for example, the impact on probation officer practice in decision making, in assessment, the delegation and deferral to technological assessment, reduced use of discretion, and so on. So possible uh, uh, unintended consequences of the use of AI, I suppose where the AI comes face to face are in conflict with the human element. That's one question. It is from Steve Pitts, and it's about that AI might help or hinder the interaction of, for example, the prison and probation systems with other parts of the criminal justice system, uh, such as the police and the courts and so on, and are there, you know, pros and cons about that? And the third question is, given that some staff are probably fearful about the development of AI and its impact on their work, 
what are the best, what's the best way or what are some approaches that we could take to bringing staff more on board in the development and rollout of AI in prisons and probation? Uh, so there's the unintended consequences, interagency aspects of AI, and then bringing staff on board. So if I could be very dictatorial and say, could each of you take one of those, if anybody wants to jump in and respond, one each. Maybe I will start on the unintended okay, Steve. consequence. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's a risk. Um, uh, one reason to have recommendations and best practices is to reduce the risk uh, of unintended consequences based on what we know. But there is, of course, a, a, a huge amount of things we don't know. So I think part of the thing that Matt was saying, we have to experiment, although in some contexts we have to be very careful to experiment. We cannot experiment with everything, of course. Uh, so, but I think uh, what is also important that we have to take other principles and practices like good governance, uh, uh, good design, uh, uh, implementing all stakeholders, uh, do good risk assessments uh, um, and look at the impact of technology from a holistic perspective. Uh, uh, to 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 try to reduce those those unintended uh, consequences. So it's it's a huge task, and and it's it's I I would say that the challenge of 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 using technology is is often not the technology, but it, the, the the change and the transformation aspect that it brings into your organization. And there often uh, are are lying the majority of the unintended consequences. So uh, uh, it's 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 very important to look at this carefully. And like I already mentioned. All those kind of projects should be organizational and business-driven projects, and 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 not only seen as technology. Technology is just a little part of the whole project uh, uh, that uh, that you are uh, uh, doing. So uh, yes, other uh, unintended consequences to risk the risk for that. But there are also like a, a lot of uh, ways in in trying to avoid those risks. There, I can tackle okay. and you know, Steve. Like, Pia, can I ask you that? What? Yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Matt. Yeah. Wanted to say something. Yeah. No, I was just, just going to offer to tackle the idea of how do you get staff familiar and, and buy in. Yes. Okay. I Please do. It. Yeah. And I think for for me, it goes to where where you are going to pilot an experiment. You, you include people on the front end. You just don't impose it on them. If they're involved in the front end, they may be able to influence it more. And if you focus on the grunt work or the tasks that people least like to do and see if AI can eliminate that so they can be more focused on the professional aspects of their work rather than the paperwork and the mundane, that may be another tool that may help people get one behind AI and more invested in it. Like for example, I know, um, you know the location monitoring is a big challenge because you have to have people available 24 seven to respond to alerts and distinguish substantive alerts from, from minor ones. You know, if, if AI can help with that, and so the offices can make better decisions, but I think if, and this goes back to Pia's point uh, and the regulations generally, the principle has to be at the end of the day, a human's making the key decision. And the answer can never be of an officer, the computer told me to do it. That should, that's never an acceptable answer, or never should be, never, hopefully never will be. But I think all this experimentation early on may help us resolve all those things. And if people are included in the discussion, we may come up with better results in the end. Very good point, Matt. Thank you for that. Pia, would you like to respond to the interagency question, how AI can help with that aspect of the work? That's a, that's a good question because at least in Finland and due to the GDPR and everything, the government departments different communities and on the other hand, prison and probation service uh, uh, must keep their information to themselves. So we cannot share information. Um, in some cases, we cannot share it at all. But on the other hand, yes, we, we can collaborate in, in many other ways. And maybe in the future, uh, when things proceed, we find more, so more solutions to these. Uh, I think regarding rehabilitation, the continuum between different uh, uh, officials, departments, and 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 communities involved in the process of rehabilitating and reintegrating the the offender, uh, the, the, making this continuum possible, and also facilitating it with digitalization is very important. 
So the possibility to use different services uh, already from inside closed prison, for example, and using modern technology to, for example, find suitable services for yourself, which is the idea behind the Finland's national AI program to help the help uh, people find suitable services regarding their specific needs, which is also the idea behind the AI system that we are developing for our own offender management system, but inside prison service. So, yes, there are challenges, but also possibilities. Yeah, Absolutely. And it comes across clearly, Pia, from what you're saying, that a big part of the the challenge or the task is about not overcomplicating things. Some of the very positive benefits can be quite simply uh, or readily simply implemented. Okay, I want to move towards a conclusion or a, a, a closing phase of the webinar and to give our three presenters the opportunity for a for a very brief final point. Uh, if there's anything that they want to add by way of summing up as we come to a close of the webinar. So I want to give Pia the last word as our um, first and primary presenter. So maybe I'll go back again, as we've just done, to Stephen, first of all, and then to Matt, and then finish up with Pia's concluding thoughts. Stephen. Thank you, Vivian. Yes, I think it was a very interesting conversation. Uh, I think it's important message that AI is a type of technology and uh, one of the basic principles, important principles that we that we learned from also a PS explanation is that we want to keep the human in the, in the loop, in the lead. Uh, and in order to do so, we have to uh, take the lead as an organization also, set the scene, uh, set the boundaries, not only relying on external recommendation, but internally in the organization, set the boundaries and remember that technology has, is made by human beings and can, can also be changed by, by humans. And so um, just not think of the technology as some things that overcomes us, but think the lead in, in designing and shaping how you implement it in your organization. Thank you, Stephen. Very well put. Matt? You know, when, it, when I tell people that I'm working on projects related to AI, I joke with them that I am amazed by the great things that AI is going to be able to help us to do before it kills us. And that is somewhat facetious, but uh, I, it doesn't have to be that way. I think, again, in, in criminal justice, our outcomes are less than optimal. This may be the very tool we need to really fundamentally change things and reach goals that uh, predecessors could only have dreamed of. But if we don't do it wisely and thoughtfully and collaboratively, like this call is helping do, um, we do have that risk that it could have the unintended consequences and wind up hurting more than it's helping. Very wise words as always, Matt. Thank you for that. Pia, over to you for the final, final word. Yeah, I agree with Matt and, and Stephen. And we must remember that AI is a tool. So uh, it, it does exactly what we uh, tell it to do, how we develop it, how we design it, because the human is there always, always behind. So it's up to us to use it in an ethical way and, and, and remember it all the time in the process that uh, why we are using AI and how we are using it and also monitor and control it. Uh, it it's our task to take responsibility of AI. Uh, in Finland, we use this uh, comparison sometimes to AI that you can think about a knife. Knife is also a tool. So you can either save somebody's life as a surgeon by using a knife, or you can kill someone by using a knife. So it's uh, up to us to decide how we use these tools. A very good point on, on which to finish uh, this afternoon, Pia. So, so thank you very much for that. And I do want to say a huge thank you on behalf of all of us uh, to Pia Pualaka, Matt Rowland, and Stephen van der Steen, our, our three presenters for uh, the webinar today. It's been a really fantastic discussion, fantastic presentations. So thank you all for that. I want to thank everybody who's been in attendance today, watching and listening. Just to remind everybody that this event will also be available as a podcast uh, and on YouTube. So do encourage your colleagues to listen in and join the conversation with INCJ, the International Criminal Justice Network. I would also rem remind everybody uh, that uh, all of our material is available on the International Network for Criminal Justice website, which is criminaljusticenetwork.net. And also uh, media postings are available on other platforms, including X at 
INTCJ network. And specifically, I want to mention two recent podcasts, one uh, recently on the 29th of April on digital rehabilitation in prisons, which was uh, also uh, um, a collaboration on the launch of the UNICRI uh, report on digital rehabilitation in prisons. And also we touched today in the discussion on aspects of rehabilitation using technology in prisons. And there's also an INCJ podcast uh, available on our uh, website and other platforms on the psychology of digital tools in correctional settings, which Pia Pualaka and Joe Clark were the lead presenters on as well. So thank you all very much for your attention, for your input. And I very much want to echo the words uh, th th from, from Matt, who said that a lot of people uh, are staying on the sideline. I was very conscious, Pia, that when even when the Council of Europe started to develop the standards on the use of AI in prisons and probation. There were some voices that said maybe we should wait a bit longer because uh, AI is at such an early, relatively early stage of development that we need to see more of what it does in practice before we develop the standards um, at, at, at this point. But uh, as Matt said, we don't need to wait for the dust to settle. We do need to get involved, to get engaged partly because of the huge cost for not doing that. So it really is important uh, what we've been listening today regarding the development of standards in the Council of Europe and elsewhere. Thank you all once again, presenters and everybody else for being in attendance. Thank you very much. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.